is criminal that there are not more parents of autistic children and I'm shook right now. If you don't follow me, I'm an ADHD advocate and I also believe that I have undiagnosed autism. I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD until October 2021 when I was 30 years old. I also struggle with chronic pain to the point where they think that I might have fibromyalgia. And because I have really bad chronic pain, my doctor said, hey, you should try this low-dose naltrexone. So naltrexone is actually used for addicts in recovery. But studies have found that in low doses, naltrexone can actually heal so many nervous system issues. Things like fibromyalgia are actually triggered by trauma and your nervous system being traumatized, causing it to not function properly. So they found that if you take this low-dose naltrexone, that it can really help you with your chronic pain. Now, when I personally started low-dose naltrexone, I also take Vyvanse. Within a few days, I am telling you, my entire life changed. I have never felt so happy in my entire life. I didn't put it together until I saw this video. It is working so well for me because not only is my chronic pain caused by my nervous system, but all of the autistic symptoms I have are due to sensory issues, which is a nervous system issue. Now, I also watched a video last night. This is not scientific research, but it was a girl saying that she highly believes that autism, undiagnosed and untreated for so long, actually causes chronic pain, such as fibromyalgia. Due to your body being in fight or flight mode and you not understanding how to deal with these big emotions and big feelings. So it would make so much sense that the low-dose naltrexone that is treating the fibromyalgia is actually treating the sensory issues and the nervous system issues that come along with autism. It is so crazy to think that all of the problems that I have been having, that people try to put labels on that said that my body was breaking down, are actually caused by undiagnosed ADHD and autism. And a lot of times, if I just stim and get out my issues and get out my really big feelings, my pain goes away. But I will tell you, the low-dose naltrexone has absolutely changed my life. And as the girl said in this video stitch, it is one of the cheapest medications. So if you are struggling with ADHD, autism, chronic pain, I highly, highly recommend taking low-dose naltrexone. Not only that, it has helped me so much with my binge eating disorder, and I am actually sober for the first time in my life. I'm about to celebrate eight months sober. Because if you take a drink while you're taking low-dose naltrexone, the alcohol just doesn't work. This drug has helped me so much. Anyways, this just blew my mind and I wanted to share my personal experience. Bye. There is a specific autistic experience that I don't think we have language for and I would like to come up with a phrase for because I think it's a specific type of trauma that neurodivergent kids experience. All of us experience it sometimes. Um, and I think it's what triggers masking. And I wish we had language for the events that triggered masking. So um, the experience, the trauma that I think every neurodivergent child will relate to is remember being a child when you would find something that was sensory pleasurably pleasurable. Like I remember in fourth grade one time I was, whoa, uh, one time I was playing with the cake that we were like doing something with for an activity and I got, I just like got it into my hands and I was like smushing the frosting, the frosting and the cake and it just felt so fucking good. I remember as a fourth grader being like, oh, I just like love this feeling. It's amazing. There's a little bit of like rebellion in it and like, I don't know, I was just in my own world and really fucking weird. Um, looking back now, I'm like, oh, it was autistic. I was sensory seeking. This is a thing that we do. Um, but what I remember is, you know, when you come back to the reality and you you look around and there's inevitably neurotypical people or grownups who are looking at you and they're like, this is like so unacceptable. This behavior is just what's happening is out of control, you know, and it's even worse if there is some kind of like explanation given for the behavior that assumes bad intentions, you know, something like, oh, you're just always trying to get attention or always trying to be unique or need to make life difficult for everybody and make it as messy as possible. Like these are types of things that just kind of roll off adults' tongues towards neurodivergent children. And the problem is this happens again and again and again. And socially it starts to happen where you're like at the dance and you're feeling the music and you're letting your body move. And it feels like ecstasy, to be honest, like it's flow, like these moments where I'm embodied and I'm just playing and I'm, and I'm in pleasure it's the happiest I feel. It's joy. It's flow. 
But so often it would end looking around, realizing nobody else was in that state with me. Nobody else was doing like weird shit with their bodies. You know, they're actually just watching and thinking like, that's really weird because it's different. And that is like a, a betrayal or like a rejection that is deeper than I've ever been able to articulate, I think, because the shame is so intense. The shame is like, oh, I should have known. I should have known that I wasn't safe to be weird here, you know, or I should, I shouldn't be like this. And especially as, as like a adolescent, as you're growing up, that's all that matters. That's survival is, am I acceptable to my peers? So as an autistic, you just learn really quickly that like, I got to assess everything first before I know how to act. So me and Mouse are in a garden centre and us being neurodivergents are just slapping pots because they make fun noises and they found out something, haven't you, Mouse? (laughs) Jurassic Park, bitches! Serious question for those with a touch of the tism. Do you feel like an adult, like a real actual adult? Cause I do not. I feel like a 12 year old, 35 year old. Like most things I know how to do, but they're so exhausting. And a lot of the time I feel like a really clueless smart person. If you give me a task and very clear instructions of how to do it, I will not only do it perfectly, I will improve upon it. But if you give me a vague set of instructions like, go get a better job, how, how, that, nobody knows how to do that. It just happens. How do you do that? I don't know. I especially notice when I have not taken my ADHD meds that I, I don't want to say that I mentally regress in age, but it does seem like that. Like I, I know what to do. I know who I am. I know where I am. I know what I'm doing, but it's a lot easier and more comfortable and so much simpler to honestly kind of regress a little bit. Using actual complex sentences takes a lot of mental effort that I don't always feel like I have the energy to do. I don't know. I'm on a journey. Literally, like I'm in nature. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so cold. I want to talk about autism and anger rumination. To ruminate on something is basically to get stuck revisiting a certain thought, feeling, or event that has happened to you. It's very common for rigid thinkers and therefore a pretty common behavior for autistic people. In fact, studies have shown that autistic people often experience anger rumination at higher rates than other people. It has been described as being a maladaptive form of emotion processing that entails remaining focused on the stressor through repetitive and passive dwelling under distress, past mistakes, regrets, and shortcomings. This was something I really struggled with earlier this year, and it was deeply embarrassing for me to admit that. I had a friend who hurt me very deeply, and I became obsessed with that hurt. And I was essentially torturing myself by just reliving it over and over and over again. To this day, I still have to be very careful with managing reminders of this person because I don't want to fall back into that pattern of thinking. Because getting stuck in that pattern prevents me from moving forward with life. How are you? I'm okay. It is criminal that there are not more parents of autistic children and autistics themselves who know about this, so I'm going to continue to stitch it until I'm blue in the face. Like many women, I received my autism diagnosis as an adult, and one of the first things that my doctors did was put me on low-dose naltrexone. Parents, so many of the breakdowns that your children have or the need to hide or or any of those behaviors are due to the fact that our nervous systems are not regulating things like they should be. And we are overwhelmed, we're scared, we're anxious. Autistic adults, it's easy for us to forget when we're showing signs of sensory overload ourselves. We become irritable, emotional. Women especially, it's easy to be like, oh, I just thought it was my period or something, when no, you're in severe like overload, and if you don't manage it, it's going to affect you for days. 
I've gone nonverbal twice in my life. And both of those times were because I was in severe overload for so long and just ignored it that I went into autistic meltdown. Low dose naltrexone. Naltrexone is used on label to treat people with addiction. In low doses, it for autistics takes our sensory issues and literally turns the volume down like at least 80%. Studies about it show like overwhelmingly in like seven out of nine autistics, it makes a huge difference. Not only that, naltrexone has been around for ages and it is extremely safe. And not only that, but it treats a multitude of other issues that autistics commonly experience. Gut issues, skin rashes, eczema, like this stuff is amazing. And on top of that, it's insanely cheap. Out of pocket when I don't have insurance. When I don't have insurance, a 120 day supply of this costs me $11. Yet parent after parent, autistic after autistic, when I talk to them about this, have no idea. They've never heard of it. When I started taking it, I think it was about the third or fourth day, I woke up at around 2 a.m. And suddenly for the first time, and I don't know how to, else to explain this, I finally felt like I was inside my body. And I didn't even realize I hadn't before. But suddenly I just felt like grounded and everything was so quiet and I didn't feel agitated. And it was, it was like a thorn had just been removed from my foot. Like a thorn that I had had my entire life was finally out. That's the, that's the only way that I can explain it. So all I'm saying is that I'm just trying to get the word out. It, it, it's probably going to work for you. It may not. It's not 100%. But for those that it does work for, it's such sweet relief. Before I was diagnosed with autism, I thought I had reoccurring concussions. I thought I had a special grade of seasonal allergy. And I thought I had the most dog shit immune system. But I have figured it out. How to separate autism from other human body dandruff. Let's say you wake up extra porous and you think, oh my gosh, I must be sick. So you go to the what condition system that I learned Excel to make. You have brain fog, having a hard time paying attention, feeling irritable, maybe a little cold. You were not in contact with anyone sick. Instead, yesterday you had to walk far to get your safe food, which exposed you to your neighborhood mafia's heavy hammer construction and a general unpleasant street smells. You also slept three hours last night because you were researching signs of Messi's autism. Da, 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 da. The system tells you you are more likely to be experiencing sensory overload and sleep deprivation on a full-blown cold. Makes a lot of sense. I filled out the chart based on how my own conditions overlap, based on which symptoms I've identified as indicators of those conditions, and based on how weighty those symptoms are for me, so this fits my body profile. But it is customizable. You can always unhide the formulas and mess with them yourself. And they're running for these blank spots as well. You can find it with all of my other templates where these things are usually found. Oh, these aren't homemade. They were made in a factory. A bomb factory. They're bombs. I'm autistic. I'm also autistic. I was diagnosed as a child because it was very easy for people to recognize autism symptoms in me. I was diagnosed later in life, mostly because I mask so well, it was hard for people to identify my symptoms. I struggle with masking. I struggle with unmasking. I struggle with empathy. I also struggle with empathy. I don't really feel it. Oh, well, that's okay. Uh, I feel too much of it. It's really hard for me to put myself in other people's shoes. It's really hard for me to take myself out of other people's shoes. There always seems to be a rhyme or reason for why people do what they do. I'm not able to live on my own. I can live on my own, but there's nothing wrong with needing support. We don't really have a lot in common, but we're both still autistic, which means we do have one thing in common, a favorite spoon in the silverware drawer and a hatred for Sia's film music. <gasps> I, think I, I think I know more about American yeah. film than you do, you genius. When your doctors start telling you that you have OCD, depression, general anxiety, social anxiety, and possibly a personality disorder, you're autistic. You're autistic. Take all that other shit out. Oh, and icing on the cake if they're like, oh, you just have PTSD from being bullied as a kid. It's autism, bitch. So there's this phenomenon that happens when you realize you're autistic, which is that you start reevaluating your entire life starting from childhood. And I just had this flash of a memory from my second semester of my junior year of college where I had basically like a mental breakdown and had to go on medical leave. So my parents took me to a psychiatrist who, after a 90 minute session, told my parents that I had an unidentified mood disorder and that he wanted to put me on Wellbutrin. <laughs> The other day, my tremors were really bad, and I spilled fried rice all over my stove and couldn't figure out how I was going to clean it up, so I just had a freaking meltdown and felt, like, doomed, like I was non-functioning, and I just decided to eat a ginger chew to regulate my senses, and then I was literally fine. Like, sir, that's not a mood disorder, that's fucking autism. 
Yeah, because I'm autistic, so like... Wait a minute. What? Yeah, I have autism. Really? You don't act like you have autism. Hmm. What do you mean by that? I mean, you understand social cues, you act normal. I don't understand how you're autistic. Uh, that's because I'm masking. Uh, every single one of my autistic traits is barely ever shown in public because I've conditioned myself since I could conceptualize socialization to um, act like a normal person and not actually myself. So that's why I don't look autistic or act autistic. <laughs> okay, but doesn't like everybody do that to an extent? Yes, to an extent. I surpass the extent by a lot. Well, at least you're high functioning, you know? Yep, so much functioning happening for me. Where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from? Cut and I do. Okay, so, I went to go pick some, set something down on this table here. So I set it down. Then I sat there and I was like, what's my next move? Do I go pee? Do I need to poop? Do I survive now? No, I'm in this world's TikTok. I don't think I want to do that. Do I go eat something? No, I can't wait. something way too many to do it for that. Do I walk the dog? No, I don't want to go outside. I just watch him anyway. It's fine. Do I hit the gas against the um, do I go brush my teeth? No, I can't. Do I, why am I stuck here? Why am I stuck here? What, what am I doing here? I'm just, I have to do something. What am I gonna do? I have to do something, but there's so many other things that go with doing the one thing. Like, it's just not one thing. There's just not one thing. It's so many things. And I'm just standing here like this, literally, just frozen like that, thinking about what I could do next. And then all of the 20 million things that come after with it, all the other demands that pile on. It's, exhausting and I know to some people this just sounds like I'm complaining but like do you get frozen like this over the decisions frozen literally just frozen like that thinking about what I could do next Okay, hey, go watch Demi's video. Um, she beautifully portrays the decision paralysis and decision fatigue that PDAers, pathological demand avoidant autistic people experience every day, <laughs> all day, every day. And um, since I've been self-medicating with cannabis more regularly these last couple weeks, this is the biggest change that I've noticed. I am feeling bored and that boredom is calm instead of like bored panic. Like I'm like, nothing really sounds like it would be all that fun to me. And that's cool. Like, I'm just going to sit here and vibe. I'm just going to listen to music and I can do that. Or I'm going to do the laundry and I'll watch a movie because that'll make it rewarding to me. Sure. Let's do that. There's none of that. Like, but if I do the laundry, that means I, I'm not going to be doing this and I'm using my energy for this. And then I'm not going to have energy to do this later. All that panic is gone. It's like, I just don't have the paralysis that I normally do. Even with no added energy, like my body is still just as sick in recovery as it has been, but with the cannabis in it, I'm not getting frozen like this. I'm just like, do I want to do that? No, I'm not going to do it. Do I want to do that? Yes. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. Easy, done, solid. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no stress. Like, I mean, and to be fair, I have people right now handling a lot of the demands for me, but even things that normally I wouldn't be able to do, like making food for myself has become relatively easy and simple easy to motivate myself to do, easy to execute. Like, what the fuck? Why are we not all just on cannabis all the time? Why do autistics need to know why things are the way that they are? Are you sure I know the answer? It's a pers personal theory. It's not based on anything. But you know how psychologists and people in general tend to say that autistic people have rigid thinking or black and white thinking? That's actually very inaccurate and kind of ableist. Because what's actually going on is that unlike holistics who have an understanding of concepts as individual concepts, we tend to see everything as connected. Which makes a lot of sense because as we know, autistic people are very good at recognizing patterns. 
so we basically have this giant map in our heads of everything we have ever learned in our lives and every specific definition or a fact we know has its very specific correct position in the map everything has its very specific place where it's connected to the right concepts in the map so when we learn something new that doesn't add up or somehow contradicts the map that we already have we just don't accept it we reject it because we rely on the map which is why we tend to have this stereotype of rigid thinking and i think that it's also the reason we tend to ask why things are the way that they are because it's not enough just to know the new thing as a fact we need to understand the logic behind it we need to fully understand that new concept in order to position it in the right place in relation to the other things in our map so yeah that's at least my personal theory so basically what i'm trying to say is that i'm sorry if i came off that way it's just because of my autism i'm gonna stop you right there you can't keep using autism as your excuse you need to be better i'm sorry what you are always saying, oh, I'm sorry, autism this, autism that. You can't always play the autism card. You're saying this as if I'm using my autism diagnosis as an excuse. That's exactly what you're doing. You never change. Grow the fuck up and admit that you were wrong and do better next time. Okay, I am admitting that I'm wrong and I am trying to do better for next time, but I need to communicate why I responded the way I did. And the why is my autism. See, there you go again. Not everything is about the fucking autism. Yes, it is. <laughs> this is never going away. It affects how I communicate and interact with people on a daily basis. I have coping mechanisms and I communicate when I have certain needs. But that doesn't always help if I'm not being accommodated. Therefore, I have my outbursts like any other human being. I understand that your autism diagnosis is difficult at times, but you do fine 90% of the time. So I don't understand why you're making such a big deal out of this. And I don't understand why you're being an ableist piece of shit. Yo, it has come to my attention that stimming while you're listening to music is not normal. Or I didn't know what I was doing with stimming. I just thought like... When you listen to music, you know, you got a vibe. I thought it was vibing. But, kid you not, yesterday, I was I was at work. And my coworker that I don't really talk to that much, she was like, bruh, watching you listen to music is so funny. I was like, <laughs> why? Like, what's, what's going on? <laughs> she was like, she was like, for a week straight, you was up in your car listening to music like this. Yeah, I was vibing. No. No, that's called stimming. I know what stimming is. I do it all the time. But damn, bruh. I can't do nothing. <laughs> the crazy part is, you know. You know you're autistic. You just don't know that's autism. You know there's something wrong with you. Why you have to have a script for every social interaction you're gonna have. Like you create the whole plan and when it doesn't go to script, you have a meltdown. You have meltdowns for very specific things. Very specific things just, they just make you see red, right? Always getting those migraines because of the light. You don't have a lot of headlight. You like using natural light because the headlight hurts your head. Hmm. Interesting. You're really good at most hobbies you take up. If it stimulates you, you become an expert overnight. Things that take people 10 years, you can do in like a month. You have 40 thoughts in like a minute. You map out your whole day in like a minute sometimes. After one hour of honest work, you get drained. Like you feel like you had a whole long day worth of work. You find solace in animals. You love animals. They bring you peace. They bring you joy. You'd rather have fun at home than going out to a club because it's just too loud and too noisy and too stimulating. 
you sometimes struggle with words and stutter, you were either really gifted or did really poorly in a class, no in-betweens. Like, babes, I can go on and on. You, you're, you're autistic. I hate to break it to you, but you're autistic. And it wasn't a whole emotional journey for me. Like, putting a name to it, I did the whole crying, did all of that. But what came out of it is, I rarely have social anxiety now. Because I stopped masking. I stopped hanging around with some people who forced me to mask. I'm more myself just by putting a name to it. I can tell you your experience. I can tell you what to do, but sometimes putting a name to something helps. I don't know. That's just me. It's meltdown day over here. And like other creators, I feel like it's important to document the these things as we go through them. If you just watch my page, normally you don't see me like this. And it's important to show. My dad is recovering from his heart surgery and he's doing well, which I'm glad for. It's meant that I don't get any time for myself and haven't in quite a while. On top of not having my own home <laughs> to have my own time to myself, I now no longer even have time to myself. My sister is up to help, but I'm not sure how much help it is. She shows up in the morning and doesn't say when she's going to be here and then just kind of works all day and I end up having to do even more. I already do the dishes all the time. I thought you were here to help. Now it's like all the dishes of a house full of people instead of just me. I've been trying to save this off and this morning dad wanted pancakes for breakfast and so I kind of held off until he got up and then asked him like, hey, so you want me to make you pancakes? And he's like, oh no, I can't eat pancakes. I'm just going to have a bowl of cereal. I put off having my breakfast to make this man pancakes. Oh, he never really was going to be able to eat them anyway. I still wanted pancakes and so I ended up making them for myself and as I'm doing so my sister kind of laughs at me why are you making pancakes and I'm like what are you talking about I'm just making breakfast she's like well we're going to have lunch with our aunt and uncle in like half an hour you never told me that you never told me that at all well yeah I told you we were going to be having lunch with them today you never told me when oh I didn't find out until last night apparently dad had an appointment and so we had to have it at this time dad's coming too and I looked down and realized that I had put twice as much milk in the pancakes and that they were unusable. Threw the bowl in the sink, splattered better everywhere, and just left the room. Didn't yell or scream, though, which is progress. I am not like other people. I am not like you. You cannot just make plans or fail to make plans or fail to clarify or change them at the last minute. I've been this way my whole life. How come you still don't understand? Why does everyone have autism nowadays? Stats show that autism prevalence increased by 178% between 2000 and 2016. Some people argue that autism is just becoming more common. Others say too many people are claiming being autistic. And let's not forget the ableist statement of it's a spectrum and everyone is on it, which is blatantly incorrect and harmful. The increase actually has to do with developing research and the inclusion of oppressed groups such as women and people of color. It was initially thought that women couldn't even be autistic, but recent research has shown that there might even be more autistic women than men. The main difference between the sexes is that women tend to be more socially aware, which makes us start masking very young. If a young girl doesn't fit in with the other kids, she's immediately scrutinized and forced to mask and adjust her personality. Also, when a young girl is quiet and won't speak, she's just labeled as shy. But when a young boy is quiet and won't speak, he's immediately tested for autism because it's so out of the ordinary. And this is why women go undiagnosed. Boys are diagnosed with autism four times more often than girls. Now, in regards to ethnicity and race, white children are diagnosed 19% more than black children and 65% more than Latino children. I'm an autistic Latina, I'm 100% Puerto Rican, and that makes me part of the most undiagnosed demographic. My psychologist was an autistic woman focusing her PhD in autistic women. When I got initially misdiagnosed with bipolar, BPD, and schizotypal personality traits, the first thing that she asked me was if my evaluator was white, a man, and old. He was, in fact, a white old man. She warned me that women of color tend to be diagnosed as anything other than autistic because we're stereotypically labeled as crazy. So no, autism isn't more common now. We're just becoming more educated, have more access to resources, and research is furthering to finally include minorities. Bye guys. Like, I remember constantly being told during meltdowns that I was being manipulative, that I needed to learn that crying wouldn't get me what I want. And you know what? The joke's on them. Now I cry every day at nothing. So, hmm. All right. 
One of the most devastating things for me, I was crying, but I'm totally fine. I'm having like the best birthday of my life, honestly, just also processing shit. So don't worry about me. One of the most devastating things about growing up on undiagnosed autistic, the problem was not that I was autistic, but that it was undiagnosed that my family didn't really have the education. We didn't know. I mean, honestly, my mom was highly educated on autism and she would tell other families, I think your child might be autistic because my mom is freaking genius. I think she's also PDA, autism, undiagnosed. And the problem was all the books on autism didn't look anything like her kids. She knew they were, we were a little different, but she didn't, no one was talking about PDA. So how, it's so hard unless you know about it to see these behaviors. Okay, so I'm getting off track. Let me just get back into my body for just a second. So this may be just like my experience. Maybe this isn't everybody else as a PDA child, but um, in the external world, PDA kids are like life of the party. Like they're so fun. They're social butterflies. Think Taylor Swift. I'm com I'm convinced Taylor Swift is PDA. A diamond's got to shine, that whole thing. Like they just, there's a sparkle to the PDA subtype. And they're on in these places and it's not fake. They just are genuinely really good people, most of them, I think. Anyone I've seen or know that has PDA, those are the people I say, those are the best people. I feel so safe with them. You feel safe with PDA people because genuinely there's like not a bad bone in our body because it would crush us, it would crush us if we knew that we hurt people. And it does. You want to go into marital problems and couples therapy? I'm a couples therapist. Let me tell you how PDA affects marriages. Just kidding. That's not what this one's about. So recenter. Let me get back to my body. That's ADHD for you. So what's devastating about not having the diagnosis is that at home, unfortunately, is where a lot of the PDA problems happen because kids will be demanding. They'll say, I'm thirsty. I'm, I need, I'm hungry or something, or like, it'll be like a demand because we like to narrate our world and people around us are like, why are you so demanding? Why are you demanding? And we're like, we're not, we're just like explaining what we're feeling, but neurotypicals experience it as demanding. And that's true for them. And, and it's also true for us that we're experiencing fight or flight because we're hungry or thirsty. Right. And we need help and don't have language for it. So like parents can start to feel like these PDA kids are manipulative or like sneaky because it, in, in a sense, they're correct. PDA kids are manipulative in that they can read social cues and they know how to get what they need, get their needs met most of the time, but they're not being sneaky. They're trying to get out of fight or flight and everyone else in their life sees this sparkly, fun, bright, brilliant child. And it's so sad. The parents can't see it. exhibit quite a few signs that would suggest you're on the holism spectrum. I knew it. So some of the things we tested for are how you respond to social cues, body language, things like that. So I bet I did pretty good. <laughs> no, you did terribly. What? You said I'm holistic. Yes. You were very confident. I'm confused. Very common misconception. Do you remember when I told you about an argument my partner and I were having that morning? No, not really. Yeah, you changed the subject pretty quick, which suggests that it was a little too personal for you. Where someone that's autistic would have likely reciprocated with a similar anecdote. I barely knew you. At one point I told you my mother was in the hospital, and you gave me a hug. And I said, everything happens for a reason. I remember that one. Yeah, empty superlatives. What? An autistic person would have likely responded with a similar anecdote about grief. And almost certainly would not have initiated physical contact without asking. But you needed a hug. Mm, no, not for me. But don't feel bad about it. It's common for holistics to struggle with emotional support. You give hugs to people that are sad. This though, you actually did initiate a number of conversations on your own. Yeah? Somehow pulling subjects out of thin air. You actually tested in the top 96% of conversation starters for people your age. That's awesome. Mm, not a super useful skill for employment. Oh. I'd suggest looking at sales party planning, maybe those little table topic cards. You're going to need to help others to keep your attention, otherwise you're going to struggle to stay on task. Okay. As I mentioned though, very confident with nonverbal cues. That's right. But you only seem to interpret them correctly around 50% of the time. You're quick to brush off moments where it probably would have been more appropriate to ask for clarification. It's so cumbersome. Yeah, holistics are known for preferring smoothness over clarity. But I did want to mention some of the takeaways from the scenarios you and I talked about. Like what? 
So Allistics have a much higher sensitivity towards authority figures. What does that mean? So when you were asked how much you'd be willing to donate to charity, if asked by a cashier, you were significantly more generous than if you received a charity mailer. But they're watching you. Sure. And our autistic participants tend to answer the opposite. A charity mailer would give them time to do research to figure out how well the charity is actually utilizing the funds. Didn't even know you could do that. Don't beat yourself up. There are plenty of people that lead successful lives with autism. Do I need to take medicine or, I mean, what do I do? This is going to be really difficult for your autistic partner. So I've given you a list of online support groups for them to look into. Okay, but what do I do? Sure. We have a number of resources available to your autistic partner to help learn how to handle you. Me? What about me? Another common holistic trait, being focused on yourself. I was saying you need to be very patient with your autistic partner because it's going to be pretty stressful for them to learn how to handle you. I'd like to give back somehow. Maybe spread awareness or help advance the understanding of autism. Do you know any studies or anything that I get involved in? <laughs> Heavens no, you're in no place to figure out what's going on up there, and we have plenty of autistics looking into allism. <laughs>
three, auditory processing difficulties. I'm not an audiologist and in the absence of people getting an audiologist assessment, I just ask if they have difficulties understanding what's said in movies unless it's subtitles or if they can't pick out the lyrics from songs when they listen to them. Four, sensory seeking behaviours. It's easy to think of autistic sensory differences as having sensory aversions to things, but there's often differences in the way that we seek out sensory input. And the types of sensory seeking that tends to go under the radar or is quite easily masked are things like liking deep pressure and so tending to wear tight clothing to get that deep pressure or seeking out tactile input like certain fabric and for some reason if you're a tactile seeker squishmallows is like crack also seeking out or being very particular about certain food textures two big ones are crunchy or fudgy and so these are some of the sensory differences that i've noticed that aren't quite fully hidden by any masking sometimes it's because the sensory differences aren't perceived to be different and sometimes it's because those sensory differences can't be masked but when there's a cluster of different sensory differences it's not just one or two then i'm like hmm we're getting somewhere and it has to be triangulated against the other diagnostic criteria but these are my little like oh little dingling flags and hey if you're an autistic adult self-identified or fully diagnosed let me know what your sensory differences are this study was released last week out of UCLA. It is a decade-long research study. Hi, monkey. What do you need? You want to take a bath? Good. Good. Okay, hold on. So like it states, this study is the most comprehensive effort yet to study how autism affects the brain at a molecular level. And some of what they discovered was that all 11 regions of the cerebral cortex that they studied showed changes uh, at the molecular level, showed differences. So it wasn't just in language and social interaction. It was across the board. And in fact, the largest deviance from the norm so to speak, the largest changes were in the parietal and the visual cortex, which are those um, connected to our sensory systems. So uh, not only is this showing that there's massive changes in the genetics, that this is literally through all of the brain. This is not a behavior. This is not psychological. This is literally a brain difference makeup but also it shows us how important the sensory aspect is to all of this <laughs> i do that artistic questions that get me in trouble did you know that you could do it this way no i'm Oh, no, I'm not saying that you have to do it this way. I just didn't know if you knew that. Because I thought like you were doing it that way. And that's fine if you like to do it that way. But you could also do it this way. And I find that it kind of like saves a little bit of time. But you don't, if you don't like doing it this way because you, you like to do it that way, that's, that's totally fine. Don't worry about it. But I just didn't know if you knew that you could do it this way. And if you did it, I'd love to share that with you. But if you did and you just don't want to do it, you'd prefer to do that, then go ahead. Do that. Just trying to help. Do any other late diagnosed autistic women struggle with the idea that as children we were literally trained to provide a level of intentiveness and intuitiveness and care and respect to those around us that is never reciprocated for us? We were taught to make eye contact and show interest and that not to do so broke some social contract that we never agreed to in the first place. And then the people who taught us that? turn right around and break those rules and then gaslight us when we call them out on it. Have you ever been talking to somebody about something you cared about and had them just turn the TV on while you're talking? Because I have. And I'm pretty sure that family members doing that to me is why I don't know how to tell people what my hobbies are anymore. Because I was taught a long time ago that my hobbies were weird and alternative and people didn't want to hear about it. But I would never say something like that to another person. Because I was taught about how incredibly rude and cruel that can be. I don't always want to talk about what they're talking about. I don't always want to hear about their day. But barring extreme circumstances, I make effort to do so anyways because even if I don't care about that particular topic, I care about the person. 
So to a certain degree, that care extends to things that they care about. I don't want to diminish a person's happiness when they're excited about something. And I'm really struggling lately because I'm realizing that although that was clearly taught to me, I have never been on the receiving end of it. Anyways, they're making a show out of a book series that I would say was my special interest growing up. And I made the mistake of getting excited about it and trying to talk about it to a couple people. So I guess that's why this is on my mind. So if I do not find somebody soon I'll blow up into smithereens And spew my tiny symphony All up and down a city street While trying to put my mind at ease Like finishing this melody This feels like a necessity So this could be the death of me Or maybe just a better me Now come in with the timpanies And take a shot at Hennessy I know I'm not that mentally But you could be the remedy So let me play my violin for you Traits of autism you might not know, part one. I feel particularly qualified to speak about this topic because I am number one a scientist and number two also autistic. Number one, identifying as LGBTQIA. One study put the number at something like 70% of autistics identify as LGBTQIA. The actual physiological reasons for that are not clear, although we do know that there are some genetic components to um, LGBTQIA identity, um, and there are also genetic components to being autistic. So there may be some crossover there, but we're not sure. Number two is hyperempathy. People who have hyperempathy um, feel other people's emotions almost as if they were their own. So essentially they care too much. And that one's interesting to me because the autistic stereotype is of course somebody who's unfeeling and really doesn't care about other people um, and it's just not true at all. And the last one is having a special interest in something that isn't related to science and technology. For those of you who don't know, autistic people very commonly have one or a few special interests that they are extremely enthusiastic about. So unfortunately for me, I am a stereotype. I love science. My special interest is neuroscience. <laughs> but in fact, you can have a special interest in anything. It could be in fashion, it can be in cooking, it can be in reading crime novels. Literally anything can be a special interest. It doesn't have to be related to science or technology. Please follow me for part two. I'm about to describe my experience of autism in 150 characters or less, ready? We can do hard things, but we cannot do easy things. Easy things are very hard. I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but I am doing my PhD in engineering and all day what I do is non-hydrostatic numerical modeling of waves, okay? I'm a coder and genuinely the hardest part of my day today is trying to figure out if I should shower or wash my dishes first. I know that I have to make dinner later and I wanted to work out. And so I have to work out before I shower, but I also, I like to shower before I eat. So if I have to shower before I eat, and if I have to work out before I shower, then that means that I would have to work out, shower, eat, and then do my dishes. Except that I don't want to shower if my dishes aren't done, but then I don't want to have to do my dishes twice in one day. It's the stupidest, it's the stupidest thing, and so therefore I can do nothing. Not, none of it. The things that I struggle the most with in life are the very most mundane, basic life things but I can do all the rest of it. The very hard stuff. Give me a three-phase algorithm. Mm, I'm your girl. I'm a beer and wine drinker, but once I start, it's hard for me to stop sometimes. You're an alcoholic. Y is that what it is? Yep, that's what it is. That's what... Oh, <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. I... You know how you can tell if somebody's a good friend? Stop calling them. This is like the third video of this nature that I have responded to. And I think I'll always respond to them because I think this is the biggest difference between neurotypical and neurodivergent people and autistic people and holistic people when it comes to relationships. Before I was diagnosed autistic, I actually lost a really good friendship because of this. Um, I'm a really good friend. I am a really good listener. I give awesome advice. I take really good care of my friends. If they ever call me, I will drop anything and I will go do whatever they need. I feed them, um, I buy them things, but I'm really, really bad at being vulnerable and checking up on people and being the one to reach out. It's just one of the skills I don't have 
in a relationship. Like I'm super loyal. I bring so much to the table, but if it's been a long time since we've talked, I probably won't reach out because I also have rejection sensitivity dysphoria and I'll feel bad once I realize it. And then I will like feel like maybe they need space and there's all of these social things that go on in my brain when reaching out to other people. And I feel like if you aren't able to express your needs to your friend, because me as a friend, we cannot talk for a week, a month, a year, two years. And if you message me, I'm going to be like, tell me everything. I'm not going to be like, it's been two years. I, that's just not who I am as a friend. So if you as a friend are incapable of communicating your needs and allowing your neurodivergent friends to either try to accommodate, explain themselves, um, work together, have a system, if you're just testing your friends, I feel like you're the bad friend. Y'all better come up here and get one of these. What's that? It's a chicken salad. From where? 81st Deli. What's on it? Superior. If you have watched Heartbreak High on Netflix, you know this character. Quinny! If you don't know, this is Quinny. And she is autistic. And she... She is the best representation I've ever seen on TV! No, because look at this scene! I've never seen someone else do that. What I do in my room that I don't let other people know because I feel so embarrassed that I was just... I, I'm not diagnosed, but like, I do that. I do that. Gwenny. <sighs> Representation matters. It matters so much. For anybody wondering what he's talking about, it's broken wrist syndrome, it's trait of autism. It apparently looks like this. Every damn day I get no peace on this end. Just found out that non-autistic people don't sit and worry if they're autistic or not. So, yeah. Hey, no, stop, just calm down. Why would I make them so uncomfortable? It probably has to do with your reputation. I have a reputation? They feel your methods, your theories are... Spooky? Do you think I'm spooky? I spend a lot of my time just bumping into DJs Maybe I'll stop at the grocery room. Hey, 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 hey. Are you even paying attention to me right now? Hey, why did that person seem kind of mad at you? Oh, because I've been ignoring their social cues. You, do you mean you missed their social cues? No, I ignored them on purpose. Why? Oh, because they were trying to make me feel guilty for not spending my spare time monitoring their emotional state. Um, a thing I don't have the capacity to do and have spent decades doing for other people, and I've decided I'm not doing it anymore. So what should they do if they want to communicate their emotional state to you? Uh, communicate their emotional state to me. Yeah. If hanging out with neurotypicals is exhausting, why don't you just hang out with more autistic people? That might be harder at this point. What? Well, understand my perspective. I'm autistic, and I spent my whole life studying societal norms and people's behaviors and how what I do affects other people. Sure. That's how you got so good at masking. Yep. Which is exhausting, but I can't just turn it off now. Why would you need to? I'm assuming you were implying non-masking autistic people, right? Yeah. Well, I'm interpreting everything everyone else does through this hybrid framework that I've developed to navigate the world. Doesn't hybrid imply that you understand both frameworks? Like, wouldn't you guys just native... Can I say you guys? Or is that offensive? I have no idea. I've only been here a year. Wouldn't autistic people natively understand each other? Just because we're all autistic doesn't mean that we think the same way. And I've been masking for so long without even knowing it. It's hard for me to understand who I actually am, like, natively, let alone understanding other people. I get that. 
but I guess I just don't understand why the additional framework would make things harder. Okay, let me give you an example. One of the masking things I do is I am diligently running everything I say through a filter to make sure I'm not offending people. Okay. Something as simple as saying goodbye to someone. If I'm not energetic enough, they might think I didn't have a good time. But if I'm too energetic, they'll think I'm excited to leave. Yeah. It's hard enough when neurotypicals miss social cues, and I wonder if they're upset with me. But an unmasked autistic person, I am going to guess, is going to miss those cues even more often. So now I am wondering even more if they're upset with me. But see, you understand that autistic people are more likely to miss those cues. Doesn't that make it easier to understand? No, there's just a whole new layer now of did they know about this cue and intentionally missed it to send a passive aggressive message that they're mad at me. But that's easy. Autistic people are direct. They're not usually passive aggressive. You're right. I think we made a big leap forward in today's session. What? Well, for a lot of us, when we learned how to mask, the direct communication was beaten out of us. Could just let me have this, could you? They always talk about the cost of autism in regard to therapy and medical bills, but they don't realize how much money I give to the weed man every week. So I've begun reading Unmasking Autism, and by the end of the kind of um, first chapter or introduction, I was sobbing. But one of the things that struck me was this is a person with a PhD, right? An autistic person. And as we autistics know, when, when we hear the truth about us, we, we, we it, it breaks us down in tears. This happened when I read The Body Keeps the Score. I literally couldn't read it without sobbing, so I never read it. I made a BPD video that got watched 2.5 million times and literally made tens of thousands of people cry. Because when we hear the truth about, about who we are internally and it resonates in a way that we've never heard before, we feel connection and, and it moves us to tears. Right. So consider that this guy has a Ph.D. in psychology, social psychology, behavioral psychology, and knew so little about autism that a brief conversation with a relative describing their autism diagnosis was more than he had learned throughout his entire process of getting a Ph.D. That's the takeaway from the first introduction, because we're constantly talking about authority and, and what are your credentials and this, that and the other thing. And there are no credentials in the area of psychology. I keep saying this, but this is more evidence that I am right on the money. Neurotypicals are lost when it comes to psychology. Neurodiverse people understand neurotypicals. Neurotypicals don't understand neurodiverse people. It, it, it's a deal breaker. So I, I just want everybody to kind of ruminate, hyperfixate on the fact that an autistic person went through all of a psychology degree, all of a PhD in social psychology, and learned so little about autism that he didn't know he was autistic. And all it took was one conversation with an actually autistic person to put it into very simple words that, that made him understand, oh, yeah, I'm autistic. So that's a huge failure on academia's part, plain and simple a total failure on, on academia and the school of psychology. It, it's broken. It, it doesn't understand. It's trying to enforce normal. And as Judo Christian Murray says, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Being normal in this culture is being broken and profoundly mentally ill. Um, struggling, being autistic, all, all these things that we're calling mentally ill are actually us struggling with modernity, attempting to move the human species forward. So you're welcome. Around 1 in 50 people are autistic. About 60% of autistic adults are under or unemployed. 87% of us have mental illness. Yep. Autistic people are nine times more likely than the general population to die by suicide. That's scary. We have an average life expectancy of just 54 years. And we deserve better. We deserve fucking better. In 2012, an autistic researcher named Dr. Damian Milton proposed a new theory. He called it the double empathy problem. And what he suggested was this. Maybe autistic people don't actually have social deficits. Maybe we just get along better with other people who think like us. Maybe hmm. autistic people socialize better with other autistic people and non-autistic people socialize better with other non-autistic people. Shocker. Maybe the difficulties that we see when autistic and non-autistic people try to socialize aren't because the autistic person has social deficits, but because autistic and non-autistic people are both bad at communicating in ways that make sense to the other. Boom. Now, to the autistic community, this made perfect sense. But a lot of autism researchers weren't so keen. I guess maybe they didn't like the idea that the whole history of autism research could be based on flawed assumptions. Luckily, in the last couple of years, a handful of autism researchers have jumped on board with the double empathy problem, and they've decided to test it scientifically. Ooh, that's in one it. brand new study by Dr. Catherine Crompton from the University of Edinburgh, they did this using a task called a diffusion chain which in Australia we know by the slightly politically incorrect name of Chinese whispers. Or telephone. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. 
you whisper a piece of information around a group of people one by one, and you try to keep it as accurate as possible. And if you've played, you know that the accuracy part is pretty hard. The first person will whisper a perfectly innocent sentence like, This is funny. Today I need to pay my rent and get new tires. But by the last person, Donald Trump is president and the world's on fire. <laughs> well, in Edinburgh, they played that game with three groups of participants. The first group was all autistic people. The second group was all non-autistic or neurotypical people. And the third group was a combination of autistic and neurotypical people. The researchers found that the all autistic and all neurotypical groups were equally accurate in their information sharing. But equally the combined accurate. autistic and neurotypical group was significantly less accurate and less clear in their information sharing. Hmm. That suggests that autistic and non-autistic people communicate equally well. It's the mismatch between those communication styles that causes the problems. Exactly uh -huh. as the double empathy problem predicts. All right, bring it home. We need a paradigm shift in the way that we think about autism. Yes. We need to recognize that maybe acting less weird is not the best outcome for an autistic person. What? We need services and supports that will help us to live long, happy, and fulfilling lives while respecting our right to be authentically autistic. Revolutionary. And we need the kind of work that I do. Research yeah. led by autistic people that answers the questions autistic people want answered. Where do I sign up? Because... The earth is not flat. Nope. And I am not a tragedy. Amen. Around one in 50 people are autistic. About 60% of autistic adults are under or unemployed. 87% of us have mental illness. Yep. Autistic people are nine times more likely than the general population to die by suicide. That's scary. We have an average life expectancy of just 54 years. And we deserve better. We deserve fucking better. In 2012, an autistic researcher named Dr. Damian Milton proposed a new theory. He called it the double empathy problem. And what he suggested was this. Maybe autistic people don't actually have social deficits. Maybe we just get along better with other people who think like us. Maybe hmm. autistic people socialize better with other autistic people and non-autistic people socialize better with other non-autistic people. Shocker. Maybe the difficulties that we see when autistic and non-autistic people try to socialize aren't because the autistic person has social deficits. But because autistic and non-autistic people are both bad at communicating in ways that make sense to the other. Boom. Now, to the autistic community, this made perfect sense. But a lot of autism researchers weren't so keen. I guess maybe they didn't like the idea that the whole history of autism research could be based on flawed assumptions. Luckily, in the last couple of years, a handful of autism researchers have jumped on board with the double empathy problem, and they've decided to test it scientifically. Ooh, let's in see. one brand new study by Dr. Catherine Crompton from the University of Edinburgh, they did this using a task called a diffusion chain which in Australia we know by the slightly politically incorrect name of Chinese whispers. Or telephone. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. You whisper a piece of information around a group of people, one by one, and you try to keep it as accurate as possible. And if you've played, you know that the accuracy part is pretty hard. The first person will whisper a perfectly innocent sentence like, This is funny. Today I need to pay my rent and get new tires. But by the last person, Donald Trump is president and the world's on fire. <laughs> well, in Edinburgh, they played that game with three groups of participants. The first group was all autistic people. The second group was all non-autistic or neurotypical people. And the third group was a combination of autistic and neurotypical people. The researchers found that the all autistic and all neurotypical groups were equally accurate in their information sharing. But equally the combined accurate. autistic and neurotypical group was significantly less accurate and less clear in their information sharing. Hmm. That suggests that autistic and non-autistic people communicate equally well. It's the mismatch between those communication styles that causes the problems. Exactly uh -huh. as the double empathy problem predicts. All right, bring it home. We need a paradigm shift in the way that we think about autism. Yes. We need to recognize that maybe acting less weird is not the best outcome for an autistic person. What? We need services and supports that will help us to live long, happy, and fulfilling lives while respecting our right to be authentically autistic. Revolutionary. And we need the kind of work that I do. Research yeah. led by autistic people that answers the questions autistic people want answered. Where do I sign up? Because the earth is not flat. Nope. And I am not a tragedy. Amen. Oh, I've never been diagnosed. I'm not actually neurodivergent. You know, I think I might be, but, you know, I've never gotten a diagnosis. Babe. Neurotypicals eat when they're hungry. I love how we all just agreed that Gregory from Abbott Elementary is autistic and then the first episode of the new season, every scene is just him being autistic. I've managed to get the only celebrity that matters to come surprise our kids on the first day of school. America's favorite orange furry sweetheart. Clark's not that pretty. <laughs>
I don't get gritty. What's not to get, Gregory? It just doesn't make sense to me. Like my dad's landscaping business's mascot is a bush because bush landscaping. So gritty. It's gritty. Hockey, Philadelphia, America. Penalty boxes. I think you should let it go. I'm chilling. Good job, Janine. If this is what they expect of us, then it can't be unrealistic. What is this? I mapped out the entire school year so I could meet every one of the district's mandated goals. I scheduled everything down to the hour. Now, I didn't allot for this conversation, so if we could wrap this up in the next two minutes, that'd be very helpful. What if something goes wrong and you get a millisecond off of this very impressive map? I counted for that. Imagining the worst thing that could possibly happen is one of my best qualities. But one of the students understands the lesson and another one doesn't. What if a cold runs through the classroom and several students are out for a few days? What if there's a snow day? Oh, when I see that you are getting Samir, I had him last year. Lovely student, very intelligent. Have you allotted for the nosebleeds that he gets when he's excited? You're about to get evicted here who needed ADA desks, and I doubted that somebody had just thrown those away. So I asked Mr. Johnson if there was storage here. He said, yeah, I forgot because I'm a custodian and not some little storage asshole. Anyway, I went down to the school's basement and I found that. <laughs> oh, I like what you did with your hair. Part? It's nice. I get it now. I'm not not a fan. Okay, so, uh, why are you wearing headphones at work? Uh, they're not headphones, they're just noise cancelling earbuds. Well, can you take them out please, because you shouldn't be wearing them at work. I just prefer to wear them, they block out background noise. But I'm talking to you, you shouldn't be wearing them. Uh, oh, no, no, I can still hear you, they just they just block out background noise. And what if somebody wants to talk to you? Yeah, I, I can still hear them. So why are you wearing them then? Take them out. Just find all the noise a bit overwhelming. It helps me concentrate and get on with my work. Well, you better not be listening to music because you're in the workplace. You shouldn't be doing that. They're not headphones. They don't play music. They just block out background noise. That's all that they do. They I still don't think it's appropriate because how am I meant to know that you're listening? Because I'm talking to you. I can hear you. I'm listening to what you're saying. So why can't you just take them out? Because I think they're just distracting you. Not distracting me. They're helping me. They are helping me concentrate. I wouldn't be able to do my work if I didn't have them in. They're sensory aids. Just not really sure that it's appropriate because if I say yes to you, then I have to say yes to somebody over there and I just don't think that it's going to work. I think, I think you should take them out. Well, if somebody over there did need them, you should be able to say yes. I don't understand why me wearing them means that they can't wear them. <laughs> because then everybody can ask to wear their headphones at work. They're not headphones. They are literally not headphones. They are noise cancelling earbuds. They do not play music. I can hear everything you're saying. Okay, right. I'd appreciate if you didn't take that tone with me, okay? <laughs>